And it bums me out that people go out of their way to tear other people down. Mm. Um, but I think it helps me sleep at night knowing that exactly what you said. I'm not for everybody. I am extremely specific personality. Um, and I'm truly pushing that forward a hundred percent. And of course that's not for everybody. We all have such different backgrounds and tastes and of course I'm not for everybody, but the more I put my personality out into the world, the more I get emails or messages from potential clients that say, we loved your dancing videos and Dude, we'd love you to part of your incorporate, your videos. <laughs> we'd love for you to incorporate that into a, our team building exercise for our company. And I get like the weirdest opportunities now just because I'm putting my personality out there. But my favorite part is that whenever clients now hire me, they know who I am a hundred percent and they're very excited about it. So that whenever I start the relationship with them, I don't have to pretend to be some sort of like professional designer, academic version of version. my <laughs> Yeah. The Perspective Podcast is fuel for your mind and creative grind. Each week, my guests and I provide the skills for thinking bigger, overcoming adversity, and making an impact with your work. PC family, I'm joined by the one and only Meg Lewis of Darn Good Four O's in the Instagram handle. But welcome to the podcast. I'm so pumped to finally get you on the show. I feel like I've just been like, hey, do you want to get on? Hey, do you want to get on? I'm trying to plan like four months down the road now. So uh, welcome. I'm so stoked to have you here. Hello. Thank you for having me. You know, I want to say this before I forget because this is a fun anecdote, but the last time I saw you was on a dance floor. <laughs> Dude, okay. <clears throat> My first note right here is for those who don't know, me and Meg first met back at Creative Works 2017 and had an epic dance off at Rayford's. <laughs> that is sure so did. funny. That was, <laughs> I love it. Okay. Yeah, but you have way better dance moves than I do and you post them. You know, I think that's the secret to my career and to my dance is that I don't, I, I'm not. I'm not necessarily good, but I am co very confident. And that goes such a long way. <laughs> Mine, yours is truly like dance, like no one's watching. Mine's like, okay, exactly. no one's watching. I'm going to dance. Unless I've like, <laughs> unless I've been boozing pretty hard and then I'll go rip a dance floor off or like the wedding circles. Like that's my thing. I've been oh, drinking yeah. and I know the people I'm getting in the middle of that circle. Do you do the worm? Do you touch the, the wet bar floor with your body? I, not anymore. I, uh, I've had an uncomfortable experience hurting myself in a region <laughs> when I did the worm last time and I'm good on that. No more. Fair enough. <laughs> no more. So, um, wow, this is fun already. So for those who don't know about the wonderful things you're doing in this world, can you give us a brief Wikipedia page summary about yourself, who you are and you know what you're doing today? Yes. So by trade, I'm a designer, which I guess is why I'm here. Uh, <laughs> but I have, there's a lot more to my interests, my skill set, my personality than just the design skills that I have. So I like to create a career for myself that's a blend of what I have to offer the world and what I'm really interested in. So my career definitely straddles the boundaries between design, comedy, and performance art. And I'm always taking all the information that I'm gathering about myself and trying to incorporate new little things and offerings and, and things that I can create for other brands that help me to express my personality and this diverse skill set that I have to offer the world. And that's why you're here. This is more than just design. You know, it's that blender of all your, your interests, your values, your beliefs, your passions, and then how can you present that to the world? Because like I thought for me, I had to, in order to be considered successful and respected by my peers, I had to be a big time freelancer with lots of big name clients. And that's not true at all. I don't do any of that. You know? <laughs> yeah. Unless, I, I freelance here and there, but it was never like big clients. It's not what I thought I needed to do. It was more blazing my own path, which you're thriving at. Absolutely. I think that like most people, everything that I do comes from some sort of internalized history of, of what I'm afraid of and what fuels me based on fear and all of that. But I think that my biggest fear and something that's 
could be holding me back throughout my whole career is the fact that I grew up assuming that everybody hated me. And today that's kind of my default is assuming that nobody likes me and that nobody wants me and nobody will support me. And that's, you know, not, not a healthy thing to do, but that mindset has fueled me into doing everything on my own because I have this attitude of like, Oh, nobody's going to give me the opportunity. And anytime I get rejected, it just confirms that. So I kind of have learned over my career to just rely on myself and not rely on somebody else to, validate me or give me their approval for me to do something. I sort of just, if I have an idea, sometimes I'll reach out to brands and ask if they want me to make it for them. But 99% of the time, the answer is no. So now I've just learned to make everything on my own and to do it on my own. And I've finessed and figured out and finagled a way for myself to create things and make things and, and start new businesses on zero dollars, like with no overhead. And I've gotten really good at doing that. And I'm so used to doing that because I've created so many businesses and side projects over the years that uh, nothing, nothing I do relies on anybody else. It's all been stuff that I can completely do on my own. And the wonderful thing is that my skill set as a designer and as a creative, I have more in my pocket. I have more uh, at my fingertips than most people do in order to start a new business or a side project for myself. And so I sometimes I'll have to learn how to write better. I'll have to learn how to code or I'll have to learn a little bit more as far as offerings go. But 90% of the things that I need to do, I already know how to do because I can design. It's so great. So you kind of answered part of my question. So if you were able to look back and connect the dots, what parts of your, like your past experiences and adversity shaped who you are today? And for me, like the big thing was getting bullied. That was big. And now it's like, okay, building community, 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 finding my tribe and community, but I'm also hella extroverted. So it's like, I automatically want to be around people. So like your experience, like rejection was big for me being treated like a nobody, like that, that's played a big role. Is there any other kind of things, you know, doing it on your own right now and being resourceful, what other kind of things like show up in your work that truly embrace who you are? Cause for me, that, that was hard. Yes. And I'm getting better at it now. It's so hard. And that's why I feel so empowered to help other people embrace who they are. Because for my whole, you know, childhood, teen, tween, early adult life, I was either living in places or in communities where anytime I would do something that was a little bit different, I would get made fun of or somebody would laugh at me and point it out. And I learned to kind of just hate all those parts about me that people would point out all the time Same. and have that sort of attitude like it was a bad thing. And so it turned me into kind of a robot, like a curated version of myself where I would wear certain clothes that I knew wouldn't get me attention. I would act like this perfect person that was like a mix of smart and funny and introspective. And I wouldn't speak unless I had something extremely important to say, which my self-esteem was horrible. So that just meant that I would never speak. Mm -hmm. And, And so it wasn't until I found a community that gave me a safe space to explore who I was without judgment at all. These people were so amazing because I would try to wear a a different kind of pants or I would like do my hair differently or I got these glasses that I wear and they wouldn't say anything. They would just support me and still want to hang out with me. And that's all I needed to have a safe space where I could be not judged for the first time in my life and explore who I was. And that self-exploratory phase for me, which happened when I I was about 24 to 26 years old was so, so impactful for me that I, through that process, I changed everything about my career and everything I was doing and the way I thought about myself. And I started to get really empowered by the fact that the things that make me different from most people are actually the things that are amazing that will help me position myself as a as a creative in a way that's unlike anybody else, which ultimately helps me to get more opportunities, more business. It helped me to make a lot more money and it's been really wonderful for me. So now I'm just kind of dedicating my life in, in order to help other people find that for themselves. So one huge takeaway immediately is for all those people who are so worried about blending in. So people perceive them as normal when your superpower is really like standing out by being you and you basically help people tap into their superpowers. 
It's amazing because I, you know, we're always worried about our competition. And I think especially as designers, I don't know about you, but uh, historically, I always look at somebody's work that is better at something than me. Like, for example, you are so great at type. And uh, and specifically, whenever I look at your work that like whenever you're working with scripts, it's just traditionally, that would have made me feel really bad about myself to look at your work because I would never, I can't do that. Can I go bad at it? When I look at your work and I see this display in rainbows of colors, I'm like, wow, here I am too scared to break outside because I'm not good with colors. So I stay in my monochromatic. (laughs) So like, it's exactly how that works, right? Yes. We're all, we're all in deep worrying about our own selves that we, uh, yeah, I, but Exactly. So it's so easy to look at somebody else's work and be jealous of the things that they're good at. And you focus on that all the time. And what I realized is that if you can just finally become empowered by the set of things that you're really good at, and you start embracing that and pushing that forward as much as possible, you actually can make work that looks unlike anybody else's work. You can eliminate your competition. And But once you finally feel like truly empowered and excited about what you can offer, the jealousy and the imposter syndrome just kind of melts away, I found, because now that I feel very confident in what I'm good at and what I can have, you know, what I can offer the world with, it allows me to look at your work and be really excited about what you have to offer. You get to celebrate others a lot easier of victim of comparison. Exactly. Yes. Okay. Got to write that. Celebrate others. That's big, especially from like a community aspect. So, um, and, and you, you're in Minneapolis, right? Yes. So we're neighbors. Yeah, we are. <laughs> yeah. I, I need to make it up there sometime. So your community lives there. How do you go and then build community? I know you have like a, um, do you have like a, a kind of a, a co-working space and stuff that you're a I part do. of? I do. I, well yes. For those who listen in this, uh, Minneapolis or that area. I do. I have a shared workspace here called Foolproof that I started as soon as I moved here because I moved here three-ish years ago and I didn't know anybody. So I started a workspace for myself that had other desks and I just opened it up and and was hoping that people would join and then they'd become my best friends. (laughs) <laughs> and it's been such a nice way to meet people, but I'm also, I'm such a people person. I love to sit down and learn with people one-on-one. So I am always that person that's like going out to get coffee or a drink with somebody else and learning about them. So I think I've created a community here for myself. That's been very much a one person at a time community rather than trying to like form massive events or something like that. I'm really, I like to get to know people as individuals. So I've been, you know, chipping away at the entire city of Minneapolis, one person person at a time quality relationships versus a whole flock of quantity yeah I yes I'm not sure if I am a quality over quantity or quantity over quality person I guess it it depends um but in that regard yes I am (laughs) okay so for me one of the biggest struggles listeners have not only is like finding time to grind and execute outside a day job or like family, but a lot of them, they have a hard time finding their own voice and style. They succumb to like writing the trends or writing the coattails of what someone else's work that they admire and attempts to just mimic and get that attention on their work. And you clearly don't have that problem. Was that always the case? Cause you know, that wasn't always the case for me and I'm still really trying to find my style. And when did, when did you really find your thing. Yeah, there's historically, I think, as I was working with brands and on on client projects and for companies, um, my style always came out a little bit because that's my brain. My brain is capable of making very specific work. And how would you describe your style just for those listening? Even when I was in school, people would always describe my style as being clean and very friendly. And um, because I'm not uh, naturally comfortable or skilled with things that are made with my, uh, fingertips, like holding a pencil. (laughs) So I don't, I don't do many things that are hand drawn. So it ends up being extremely vector heavy. Um, and so even when I was in school, that's how people would describe my work. And, uh, as I worked with clients that would seep out and that's just kind of the work that I became known for. Um, but it wasn't until I went through a more thoughtful series of exercises because I started getting into this territory where my over my work was overlapping with trends a little bit and I couldn't tell which came first anymore. I couldn't tell if I was being influenced by trends or if this was just my style. And so I had to do a series of exercises to stop looking at work and start assessing what 
what is my skill set? What can I offer the world? And for me, the the limited skill set that I have is that I'm really good with typography and creating expression with type. I'm really good at high contrast, a lot of black and white with bold pops of colors. And, um, and, and I'm good at vector illustration and I'm good at abstraction and I'm very good at very simple, but friendly and personable design. And so knowing that information was helpful for me and to just embrace that. But I also looked back historically on what I was inspired by when I was a kid that mm. I'm still inspired by today and try to put visuals to those, not by things I was making. I was trying my hardest to not look at design, but I was thinking, okay, I I'm very inspired by, I always have been inspired by circuses, by clowns, by mimes. I love, um, silent comedy characters like Mr. Bean that are extremely emotive. Like I like love PB Herman. And so I was taking all these things and combining it with my personality and what has always been true about my personality since I was a kid until now, the fact that I love change. So I brought in some images of what change means to me and what aspects of change I like. And I put visuals to those. So changing seasons, I grabbed an image of that. Um, the fact that I like change in black and white, which overlaps with my love for mimes and emotive characters, I grabbed an image for that. And I started to just notice through lines between my lifelong points of inspiration and the parts of my personality that make me most unique. And I noticed a lot. There was a lot about, there was a lot of black and white. There was a lot of bold pops of color. There was a lot of extremely expressive typography. There were a lot of really emotive faces and and sh people making shapes with their bodies. There was a very specific color palette that I was noticing when it came to the changing of the seasons. And so it helped me both uh, give myself some validation and approval that my style was actually coming from something that was deeper and more meaningful than trends. But it also helped me to kind of create a style guideline for myself that is extremely reflective of who I am. And it's less likely for me to feel burnt out because all of these things have been so true about me my entire life that they're more mo most likely to be true about me my whole life and uh being able to translate that into a visual style and to give myself guidelines and parameters have been so helpful for me to feel really confident in what I'm doing. So that way, if trends end up overlapping with what I have to offer, I know that the work that I'm making actually means something very impactful and special to me. And so even if other people get inspired my work by my work and make something that looks similar to mine, it doesn't bother me at all because I know what's behind my work and they have no idea. Like they probably don't know at all. They're inspired by it. And so it doesn't bother me or affect me at all. Um, and the superseding trends and getting past all of this has been so <clears throat> helpful for my work and so wonderful for my overall state of mind. <laughs> Man, this is, this is gold. I don't know if people are like hearing the action steps that you're already giving. But one, before you can like go do the work you want to be known for, it's more important to do the harder work of digging deep and getting to know yourself first exactly. and connecting those dots. You know, uh, I put out an episode like showing your interest, waving your freak flag. And it's basically looking back in your childhood at all the weird shit you love then that still fascinates you today. And me, it's like I was obsessed with pizza, Ninja Turtles, um, ET, UFOs, outer space. And now it's like the cosmos and the universe and pizza still it's like the same <laughs> stuff yes but it's the same stuff it's still there you know but now it's just like I can take it to another nerdy level and like black and white and tattoo illustration styles fine liner pens that's all I loved as a kid and then the second thing you said was a style guide for yourself it's like your brand guidelines you would whip up <laughs> for someone else but like your own style guide and this helps you Kind of, you have these constraints that breed creativity that you live within and you have this now a cohesive, I guess, look and feel to all of your work. Like I think of Andy J. Pizza as the first dude, you know, everything yes. is just brand aligned. I'm like, wow, that's incredible. You have it as well. A couple other people that have it as well, like Lisa Congdon, um, Molly Jakes or people that pop into mind, like um, Lauren Hom. So how important are those guidelines that you set for yourself? Or like, how do you go about it? Like, what's an example? How do you set this up for yourself for other people who struggle with cohesiveness. Like this is something I'm really focusing on in my own lately. Yes. Well, so it, it's an interesting um, sort of push and pull because I'm, I'm not a fan of curating yourself in order to appear 
as though you're a pol- a more polished version of who you actually are. Mm-hmm. And I think that a style guideline gets in a dangerous territory where it could, could very easily feel like that's what's happening. And so that's why I think getting to the core essence of who you are, that's not influenced by anybody else or influenced by trends or influenced by influencers. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, it's so important to go through those exercises first. So that way you're being actually authentic and not like this sort of false, you know, curated authenticity that's really can be popular right now. And so it's a buzzword. Yeah, exactly. And so what I, what I encourage is that you look internally first and don't look at anybody else's work. So that way you can get to the core of what your color palette might look like, what the common themes might look like, and don't put too much pressure on yourself to every single piece you make to follow very specific rules, because that's going to make you feel really bored very easily by your own personality and skill set. But what I like to do is give myself broad parameters. So for example, I have a pretty concrete color palette that I like to stick to. Um, But within that, I like to explore and I'll add more colors every so often. And it's very exciting for me when I get to do that. Um, It's a good treat for yourself. Yeah. And so I have a list of musts, like my work must have these qualities. And then I have a work, a, a list of cans. My work can have these qualities. So for me, my musts are, I must, if it's work for myself, if there's a client a brand client that I'm solving a problem for, I will go outside of my musts because that's okay. It's not for me. Um, But if it's just for me or one of my brands that I own, then my style must, for example, I must use black somewhere. My work, uh, I've noticed over time, if I look too much at other trends or what's happening, or I get inspired by somebody else's work, I'll end up making something, for example, with my colors where it'll be like an orange background with pink text on top. And then I'll realize, no, 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 that doesn't look like me anymore. That looks like somebody else's work. I need to add black. And then as soon as I add black, it already automatically feels like me. And that addition of black, for example, is coming from my lifelong points of inspiration. The fact that I love contrast, the fact that I really love mimes, (laughs) this all (laughs) means something to me. And it helps me to showcase what that is for myself visually. So the list of musts and cans, like my work can feature circus elements if I want it to, because that's very important to me historically. And so, uh, for example, like, uh, looking through my lifelong points of inspiration and, and everything about my personality. I love emotion. I love showing emotion in faces. That's something that's very important to me. When I was a kid, I was a competitive pantomime. Uh, I was in the competitive pantomime circuit. No and, <laughs> and so acting without words, using my only my body and my face is something <clears throat> I'm a really big fan of. And so anytime there's a, I'm in a photo shoot or there are bodies in a photo or I'm in a photo, I make sure that I show a lot of emotion on my face. So anything that I'm doing, even outside of my design work, I'm fulfilling the style guideline that I've set for myself. And it just helps me to make work that I feel really proud of because it means something and it's coming from such a wholesome place inside of me rather than before I would make something and second guess everything about what I was doing. Is this good enough? It's not as good as so-and-so's work. I compare myself to other people and now I don't have that problem because I know it means something. I know I'm offering the world something visual that only I can offer the world and that feels really great. It's like, so there's the controversial thing of you are not your work. You know, that's not your identity. But at the same time, like, even if you don't like the term personal brand, like you're a personal brand, I'm a personal brand. Every day we're selling, even if we're in the supermarket, given a reference of the kind of Doritos someone's going to buy, you know, but at the same time, I feel like we are our work, but at the same time, like our self-worth isn't defined by our work. And I think a lot of people have a hard time. Like you are truly your work. If I interact with you, like we are now, and I interact with your work, it is the same (laughs) thing, you know? And I I think that's like the highest compliment you could give someone. And the highest thing I feel like we as artists should be seeking is to fully embrace ourselves within our work. You know, like that that gross to you that you are your work? It's, yes, that sounds really gross. Um, And my number one goal with my work is to just feel fulfilled by it. Mm. I just, I want to have a fulfilling life that I enjoy having And I want to live every day feeling wonderfully fulfilled. And in order to do so, I have to create work that's a total reflection of 
what's fulfilling for me, which is who I am at my core. So I no longer feel self-conscious about myself. It's the skill set I have and what I can offer the world. And it's even serving a larger purpose. Like my purpose in life I've realized is to make the world a happier place. So if I can do all these things every day in the work that I do, then my work and myself become truly one. Like there's no difference between the two and that gets very confusing sometimes, but it's fulfilling for me and that's all that matters. And so I always encourage other people to find a balance that's that's makes you feel fulfilled. The number one goal is just that you have a fulfilling life that you enjoy living. And there are a number of, way, of ways that you can accomplish that, that feel safe and secure for you. And for some people, um, their lives are so different from mine and they need different Different things that look different from me and that's okay. And that's why I really like working with individuals and to try and figure out what those things are for each and every one of us. Man, that's, that's awesome. So like, how do you go about this? Like, I know you have resources and workshops, which happily I would like to get into, especially, you know, this is something I'm interested in as well, especially like your uh, full-time you workbook or workshops. How do you help not only one-on-one -on -one creatives, but like, what are these resources and workshops that you provide to help people tap into this next level of themselves? Yes. So I, yes, I do have, I have workshops and I have a book and I'm trying to explore other areas in which I can offer this information up to as many people as possible. And my goal with all of this is to, unfortunately, I wish I cared more about business. My goal is not to make money. I wish, I wish I was making more money, but <laughs> my goal here is to just get people to figure these things out for themselves and to give them the information so that they can have a more fulfilling life and career. And so I'm always happy to offer up this information for free. Um, but it, like, if you want more hands-on stuff, I do one-on-one -on -one coaching. I have a full-time you, which is my self-discovery workbook. And then I have a find your personal style workshop that I'm working on this year. Um, but I'm happy to always run through the steps. I mean, essentially you're trying to figure out two things. You're trying to figure out what you can offer the world that nobody else can. You're trying to figure out why you're doing it. Um, what is a why that can fuel your work? Um, that is a why that is different than other people's whys. And in order to do that, it's just, it's mostly self-discovery of figuring out what about your personality makes you most unique so that when you take all of these personality traits that don't normally go together and you put them together, it makes you. And so how can you take those personality traits and the qualities of your personality that makes you the most interesting and unique? And how can you translate those both into visuals, but how can you also translate that into things that you can offer the world or make for the world or side projects or businesses or whatever that might be that you're creating the content for? And then assessing your skill set and realizing what are you really naturally good at that you've been naturally good at your whole life that you're still great at today and write those down, but also write down the skills that you've learned along the way, like the things that you've actually put your head down and worked on to get better at, write all of those skills down and try to make sure that your career is incorporating every aspect of all of those. And when we zoom out and look at our skill sets, it's a lot of random things. Like I never thought that I'd be able to find a way to mix comedy with design work as much as I have been. I really like meditation and mindfulness, and I didn't think that I'd be able to work that into my career, but I found ways to be really creative about the things I can offer the world that are a true reflection of literally everything that I can do. And that just really creates a fulfilling career because I think when we're at full-time jobby jobs, you know, obviously those jobs are only going to be able to utilize like usually I find people utilize 30% ish of their skill set. Whenever I teach these workshops to people that have full-time jobs, their jobs only allow them to use about 30% of what they can offer the world. And that is a real bummer. So that's why we end up feeling unfulfilled. That's why we start side projects. That's why we have hobbies and activities outside of work. And so I'm here to help people figure out what else they can create. If they feel like they want to be secure in a full-time job, what else can you create that helps you to feel more fulfilled in your life and your career? So there's a lot that we can do. And there's something that can work out for anybody, regardless of their background or their life experience or their current situation. There's always something that you can do to create a more fulfilling life and career. What I love is the whole self-discovery pro the process of what you, you hit on becoming full-time you because I was the kind of person who, you know, influenced, you need to get this job to make this type of money. And I worked the whole five and a half years at a corporate scene. Um, same time I had this craving to do more outside of it, but like 
influence growing up, art can't make money from that starving artist. So I was thinking I had to just do design. And then I'm putting this ladder up against this wall, feeling like this is the career that's going to make me happy because it makes me money. And like, that was never the case. And what you teach is to put the ladder, I guess, up against yourself <laughs> and climb, <laughs> climb the wall of you. Oh my God. I don't know where this metaphor is going, but you get what I mean. It's like, we, we climb these ladders against the wrong wall only to get to the top and be like, wow, this isn't what I was looking for at all. It's because you didn't do that self-discovery in the first place. Exactly. We're all so influenced by what other people tell us we're supposed to do. And that's just, we grow up being taught by people. So we're used to looking to others to figure out what we're supposed to do next. And um, I think it's it's so much of it is you just have to look inside because honestly, when I did this and when I changed my career over to being more of a reflection of what I can offer and how I can offer it, it helped me to position myself unlike any other designer that's out there, which ultimately helped me to get more work that was both in line with what I can offer the world and the style that I'm really good at. But it also helped me to get attract people that wanted to be around my personality that wanted to work with me that uh they were the right clients and audience yes. for me yes. which helped me to kind of carve out my own little uh space in the design industry and be the only person that's providing this very specific skill which has from a marketing and positioning standpoint has gotten me more money and more more work and it's gotten me a larger following and it's just been so helpful for me to start breaking away from trends and from what other people are expecting of me and what other people are doing and just figure out what I can do that's different from anybody else. So the power of you waving your freak flag is that you're sending out this beacon to attract the right type of tribe, the right type of client doing work that you truly are fulfilled by that matters to you for people that you also care about you know, which is, which is dope. And at the same time, on the flip side, your work isn't for everyone, which is okay. And that's where I used to get caught up. You know, yeah. my life motto, you can't make everyone happy. You are not pizza. Cause I grew up being the people pleaser because I wasn't liked growing up or bullied. I craved acceptance and love from people and I never got it. <clears throat> and I just think that's important to know is that your work's not for everyone. It's for the right people. So you can't please the masses. And when you try your work becomes vanilla and it's hard to like hit the right type of people. And it's good if you get the right people on the bus, get the wrong people off the bus and put your energy into those who your work is for, even if your work is just for you. Exactly. Yes. And it's, it's, it's easy to hear that information. It's easy to hear all this information and be like, that makes sense. It's so hard to actually implement it because we're all in some way getting in our own way. <laughs> and so yeah. I think that's, that's usually the first spot where I like to talk to people of in what areas are you getting in your own way? And Scotty, you mentioned it perfectly of that. Those are all the things that are getting in my way. So that's how I get in my own way is that I still want to be liked. Um, Every time I do something and if somebody says the feedback has been 95% positive, then I'm immediately like, oh. robs you of your joy, yeah, that 5%. Exactly. I get one nasty review saying, hey, you're trying to copy so-and-so. I'm like, no, I don't listen to any other creative podcasts for that reason, to not be yes. influenced. This is just, this is me, you know? But yeah. like that one negative thing. And what I've learned, is. what I've realized and truly do believe is that most of the time it really has nothing to do with you that it's usually something that mm. that person is going through that they're internalizing and projecting onto you. And we all know that anytime I've accidentally done something that's been rude towards somebody else, when I step back and think about it, it's always that it's something I'm going through or some, that person has just triggered something in me. And it's just that that person is not right for me. It's not what I need right now. And it bums me out that people go out of their way to tear other people down. Mm. Um, but I think it helps me sleep at night knowing that exactly what you said. I'm not for everybody. I am extremely specific personality. Um, and I'm truly pushing that forward hundred percent. And of course that's not for everybody. We all have such different backgrounds and tastes and of course I'm not for everybody, but the more I've put my personality out into the world, the more I get emails or messages from 
potential clients that say, we loved your dancing videos and Dude, we'd love you to your incorporate your videos. <laughs> we'd love for you to incorporate that into a, our team building exercise for our company. And I get like the weirdest opportunities now just because I'm putting my personality out there. But my favorite part is that whenever clients now hire me, they know who I am a hundred percent and they're very excited about it. So that whenever I start the relationship with them, I don't have to pretend to be some sort of like professional designer, academic version of version. (laughs) Yeah, that's, that's perfect. I mean, yeah, you're casting a wide net for the right type of fish you're trying to catch. Yeah. I I like the also thing about like the critic too, is the people who criticize are the most are the ones who don't have the courage to show up and put themselves into the world to be scrutinized as well. You know, and they're all dealing with their own thing. So it's like you being here and showing up as your true self is way more courageous than someone who's sitting on the couch being a Twitter warrior talking shit because they don't have the balls to show up and pursue something they love and go all out with it. You know, that's a very, yes, that's a very interesting point. You know, so that's, I guess that, that was, it took me a long time to like swallow that pill, I guess, but it still, it still hurts me at times too, because I had that people pleaser (laughs) mentality in me, but you know, I'm, I'm able to get over it a little bit easier now. It does. Yes. And I have a little, I have a little pep talk that I give myself because I'm sure like you, I wake up some mornings and I just don't, I don't want to do this. Like I don't, I don't want to remind the world that I exist today. Mm. I don't want to shout my personality into the void. And I have this little pep talk when I feel that way, that I remind myself that I have something to offer the world that other people don't and that I need to do it. I need to be myself because it inspires other people to want to find these things out for themselves and for them to feel safe and comfortable being themselves fully and thinking about it outside of myself and how I can affect others and how I can change their lives is really empowering for me. So I try to remind myself of that objective more often of that I'm just inspiring other people to now find out who they are and to push that forward. Dude, that's so dope. Yeah. You you're not only showing up for yourself, like that's a that's a driving force. You know, sh- this show is fuel for your mind and creative grind for those reasons. So you're already talking about your driving forces and not to just show up for yourself, but you're showing up for others in your work as a permission slip for them to do the same, to have that rippling impact. Like exactly. At the, at the end of the day, you could create for the glory. And, or you could like create and chase the impact. And by the byproduct is chasing the impact, you're going to get better paying clients. You're going to get a following as a byproduct instead of like chasing something that isn't true to you for the likes, the comments, the features, you know, it's, it doesn't mean anything at the end of the day, but this other route, you still get all that shit and the fulfillment. Exactly. Yes. Couldn't say it better myself. (sighs) This is, people are going to love this one. (laughs) Um, <laughs> something else you're wild. Um, you're already busy. You do your thing full time. You know, you create tons of content, lots of personal work resources for creatives, but you also do two podcasts. Yeah. It's, how, what wow. are those? What are they about? Where can people <laughs> listen? And then please tell me how the hell do you do it? Cause one podcast is enough for me right now. Yeah, it's it's pretty silly. I never thought I would have a podcast. And these two podcasts just launched the, this year. So they're new. And my life is kind of consumed now by podcasts, which is quite interesting. But I like podcasting so much because it's such an easy medium to work with because I don't need anybody else. I just need a, a microphone. Don't even need that. Just need a computer and a, a way to record, which everybody's computer comes with. And I don't need anything I edit the podcast, my podcast myself. And so it's been really a wonderful way for me to communicate some of these values that I have and the things that I have to offer the world in a way that it takes me less time, honestly, because I can just plop down in front of the microphone and start speaking. I don't have to like do my hair or anything. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't have to like design and push things around on a computer forever. It's easy and it's fast for me. And um, so the podcast that I do now is I host Dribble's Overtime Podcast, which used to be back in the day, uh, Dan Cederholm hosted and it was an amazing interview podcast and he had awesome guests. I was a guest on that podcast and loved it. He's a great interviewer and he separated from Dribble. And uh, so then they kind of let that podcast go dormant for a while and they decided to revamp it after a few months and they approached me 
and said, we want to reframe this podcast and relaunch it and try and figure out what we as a company can offer the design industry that other companies can't. And we're trying to figure out what that means. And to them, they thought it would be a great idea to deliver topical design news because a lot of companies and and podcasts aren't doing that right now. In addition to that, they said they would open it up to me as the host to then talk about whatever else I wanted to talk about. And my initial reaction to that was like, I don't, that's not a good idea for me to talk about topical design news because I, when it comes to design and critiquing design, I'm, as you can tell, I'm like, I, I love it. Like everything, you know, like I believe that people worked hard and there's a lot of soul and I know how hard it is to be a designer. And so my initial reaction is very empathetic and like people worked hard and, and, you know, (laughs) so my reaction to things is just like, oh, that's silly or, oh, I like it or the color's nice. And, and so it's really not very interesting to listen to. And so my reaction to them was like, no, 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 you don't want me. I don't have strong opinions about design. And they were like, absolutely, Meg, we want you because of that. We like that you like to see all sides of issues. And we like that you have a lighthearted and friendly approach to things. And it's not so aggressive and domineering with opinions. And so they've let me really embrace that part of my personality. And so now I read design news that I just find silly and fun. And I like to react to them. And I think the fun thing is that I'm learning a lot about myself in the process because I think through these news stories in real time on the podcast, and I end up finding my opinions along the way, which I think has been really fun for me. But they trust me and my voice. And it's really it feels like it's my podcast, they let me cover topics that I'm just really interested in. They let me have any guest I want. um, And we can talk about anything I want that makes me feel comfortable. And they they tell me that if it makes me uncomfortable at all, I don't have to talk about it, which I really like. And so that, that podcast experience has just been so amazing and fun so far. And what's the other one? So the other podcast I have is a comedy meditation and mindfulness podcast called sit there and do nothing. And that one is silly because it has nothing to do with design. It is where I just improvise guided meditations and stories about you doing some weird stuff. So it's kind of like a guided meditation where, you know, the, the classic, like you're sitting on a beach, you feel the sand between your toes. It's like my nighttime guided meditation. Yeah. It's like, yeah, exactly. It's like that. But instead you are like going to get a colonic, but they mistake you as a clown and you get taken and pushed on stage and have to perform for people. Or Paul Rudd picks you up and you go sneaker shopping at famous footwear or you uh, are shopping at Burlington Coat Factory and you get stuck in a sequin blazer and you have to figure out how to get out. And so it's a it's an awesome project that I'm so into because it's an area where nobody's nobody's doing silly meditations right now. And I don't know why not. The goal of meditation and mindfulness is to get you feeling centered and better than before you started the process. And I don't see how that's not possible if it's goofy and silly at the same time. So my goal is to just relax people and make them feel better and make them feel more lighthearted and a little bit freer from their brain after they've finished listening to each episode. And it's so fun to write every episode and and make it. That's hilarious. And both of these are in iTunes. You can find them pretty much anywhere. Oh yeah, they're everywhere. I'll make sure to link them up in the show notes. Um, Fun. Last question before we go to rapid fire. What's one piece of advice you give yourself when you were just starting off, whether design career, professional career, just in general, side hustle? (sighs) I covered, I feel like I've covered a lot of it, but I think the biggest thing has just been to stop comparing yourself to other people. It was really damaging and detrimental whenever I would look at intimidating creatives or other designers that were really talented and comparatively my work was garbage and it made me feel bad about myself it prevented me from going for opportunities or creating opportunities for myself and once I finally started to get excited about what I was good at and what I could offer the world then that naturally kind of shed away but it's it's so easy to just ultimately compare yourself to everybody else and realize what they're good at that you're not good at and then just sink into it and only feel that. And then, you know, like me over the years, I've tried so hard to hand letter and it just never, it never goes well. Then I feel worse about myself. And now I've realized that 
I'm not good at it. I don't enjoy doing it. And why not embrace what I am good at and then work with somebody and hire somebody and collaborate Mm -hmm. with them who is good at that thing. And then we can make something even better together. That's rad. Love it. Um, Rapid fire. We'll bang this out. If you were on death row, what would your last slice of pizza be? Okay. Um, great. So I really like a salty situation with some sweet. So I'm going to go for a pepperoni with a spicy honey and some chili flakes. Where is this from? Um, <laughs> I had it once at a, uh, I think it's called a bee sting um, from Roberta's Pizza in Brooklyn. And uh, it was something like that. And since I just kind of make it on my own, I just, I always have spicy honey on me. I'm ready to drizzle. <laughs> Dude, I would smash that in an absolute <laughs> heartbeat. Okay. Sometime if I'm ever able to make it up there, can we make pizzas like this yeah. kind? Yes, we may. Okay, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you could have lunch with one person dead or alive, who would it be and why? Um, I'm going to go for, at the top of my head, I'm going to say Larry David, um, because he, uh, he, is the opposite of me in many ways in that he hates everything and uh, is always getting in fights with people. (laughs) And I think, you know, from a mental standpoint, I think that would be really good for me to have to endure that for a meal. (laughs) Um, But also I think he's hilarious. All right. Um, If you were stranded on an Island, what are three things you have to have from refrain from dying from boredom? Okay. Dying from boredom. Um, I'm going to say a balloon animal making kit because I don't know how to make balloon animals. So there's both a learning curve and a skill that I would need to be taught, but also there's a lot you can do with balloons. (laughs) So I'm sure from a survivalist standpoint, there's probably a lot you can do with the balloon material. Um, but also it's just endless entertainment. You know, you can, uh, blow them up and then let them go. You can hear the sound, you can, watch them fly away in the wind of your beautiful island. Um, You could chase after them. It's bountyless fun. Okay, that was just one thing. That was one. Uh, (laughs) That was the most unique answer, just one out of anybody's ever given me this one. (laughs) What Um, are the other two? I can't wait. (laughs) (laughs) That's a lot of pressure. Number two is I'm going to say an inflatable pool. Um, So that way you can just fill it up with rainwater. Um, go for a little swim. I guess you're on an Island. I'm actually a little afraid of swimming in the ocean. So this would be a great, uh, solution for me. (laughs) And when all hope is lost, you can, you can use it as a ship and you can just float away on your inflatable pool. Cast away style. Yeah. Cast away style. Uh, at third, third object. Um, let's see here. I feel like it should be food related, Um, what do I use when making food a lot? Um, you know, I'm going to go with a potato masher, um, (laughs) because, uh, and this is when I don't have a, because, and I'm trying to think really fast, um, because you could mash everything. (laughs) Like your sandcastles, you know, imagine, um, like taking a, a piece of bark and soaking it in your inflatable pool and then bringing it over to a rock and mashing it up and you have a nice brown pile of mush that you can then stick your fingers in or you could try to eat it, see what happens. <laughs> I don't know. This is the most entertaining. I'm so glad I asked this question. Okay, well, how do you top this off? So uh, do you believe in aliens or other life forms existing outside of our solar system? I, did, I, how could I, how could I not? Um, <laughs> I'm a big fan of the unknown. I like that. I don't know a lot of answers and I love that about this world that we live in. And I, I think that the universe is very interesting to me because we don't know what's going on. Yes. We don't have any answers. And I like not knowing, I love surprises so much. So I love the unknown in general because it means that a surprise might be on the way. And that's what I love the most about the universe is that we have no idea. We don't know why or where or how or what is it. And that's very cool to me. So I like all the possibilities of what could be true. I love theories about um, reality and the universe and, you know, multiple realities and multiple universes and all of that's very exciting to me. So I guess that's I I would like to say that I do believe aliens exist because it's one of the many possibilities. And I like that. Yeah, I dig it too. I'm a big paranormal junkie kind of guy. Um, Okay. Last one. Where can people go to follow you online and support you? Yes. On social media, my handle is at darn good with four O's. (laughs) 
<laughs> uh, regular darn good was taken. Uh, and then on the internet, on a browser, you can go to darngood.co with regular two O's. Awesome. I'll make sure to link everything up as well as your podcast and your resources. Yeah. Um, this, this was awesome. Thank you. So this was fun. Like this was 50, fun. 50 minutes just flew by. <laughs> You're a ball of energy, your personality, everything's just infectious. I know in a good way. You're infecting us in a good way. Um, and I know, <laughs> I know people are really going to really uh, get a lot of value and enjoy this one. So thank you so much for your time. And I know you're super busy right now. So it means a lot to us. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. It's been great being here. Thank you, Scotty. Appreciate it. No problem. Have a good day. Yeah, you too. Peace. Thanks again for listening. It'd be awesome if you took the time to subscribe to the channel, hit the like button, and let the comment below so we can connect. Again, if you want to catch a shout out as a future listener of the week, make sure you subscribe to the show on iTunes and give it a rating and review.